Good morning. I want to welcome you here today on this uh, snowy Christ the King Sunday. Christ the King Sunday is the final Sunday in the long season of Pentecost, and it's the final Sunday of the church year as well, which means we start a new church year next Sunday with the first Sunday in Advent. And uh, as you can see, the, the tree was put up because they're going to do some decorating after church today to get us uh, ready for Advent. The Sunday school kids are going to be uh, doing a lot of the decorating. They could use a few uh, adult hands to help out with that, um, but we are going to have the adult Sunday school class, but if a few wanted to help out with the, uh, um, with the decorating, with help the, the Sunday school kids with the decorating right after church, they would love to have a few adult <laughs> hands to help out, help out with that as well. Um, some notes for today. First of all, in our birthdays, uh, this coming Wednesday, November 29th, Lonnie Swinford has a birthday, so happy birthday to Lonnie. On Thursday, November 30th, Noah Morgan. The Morgans have just moved uh, to Minnesota, but Noah has a birthday this week on November 30th. He'll be seven years old. On Saturday, December 2nd, uh, John Schaffner has a birthday, so happy birthday this week as well, John. We have one anniversary this week, uh, this coming Saturday, December 2nd. Jeff and Jennifer Jaquist are celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary, so happy anniversary to you. Yes. And uh, uh, Jeff is at the top of my prayer list as well, because I just saw on your Facebook post you've had the la you rang the bell for your last radiation treatment this past week. So that was just healing from that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, God's blessings to you. Uh, others that we want to lift up in our prayers today, we want to continue to pray for Linda Clock. Uh, she's been up visiting her sister, and you said she's traveling home today, was it? Today, uh, she'll be coming back, and so I'm uh, still feeling pretty good, but uh, um, uh, dealing with a very serious situation there. And then we continue to pray also for Karen May and for Lauren Cook, for Sean Lewis, Nancy O'Connor, Trudy Kreiling, and Eric Davis, who are dealing with cancer. And others with health concerns, Gary Shale and Nick and Sandy Smith and their daughter, Melissa. So that's our, our prayer, list of prayer concerns today. Um, some other notes. Um, this coming Thursday, we're going to have our, our third and final um, mobile food pantry of, of this year. And we're going to be doing it out, ha handing out the food over at the Allen Building at the fairgrounds. That is Thursday, November 30th. Uh, the truck's going to arrive around 9 o'clock in the morning, so volunteers should arrive before that, somewhere between 8.30 and 9 o'clock, so uh, we're ready to get things set up as soon as we unload, get the truck unloaded. Uh, distribution will begin around 10 a.m., and if you can bring a wagon or a cart, that would be greatly appreciated um, because that keeps the lines of the folks moving faster if we can put everything in a cart and roll or a, or a wagon and roll it out to their car and help them that way. So that's this Thursday, November 30th. Um, uh, uh, the truck will be there about 9, so uh, workers need to be there before that. Also, the Old Wheels Group has uh, put together a float for the Princeton Christmas Parade of Lights, which is this coming Friday, December 1st. Now, the parade is going to start from the uh, Covenant Church parking lot at 6.30 p.m. They do the tree lighting across the street from City Hall and Veterans Park there at 6 and then at 6.30, the parade will step off from, from uh, the Covenant Church parking lot. And so we'll have our float there. And uh, those who are going to be on the float need to be there a little before 6.30, I would imagine. You know, 6 o'clock or so, I would imagine. Uh, if you're going to be on the float, be there. Um, I, I don't know, are, you, are, you gonna, are they going to bring their costumes with them? Are you going to have them out there at the float? Or how are you going to do that? Actually, it, oh, it works up here. We could meet here at the church at five o'clock. We could get the costumes on, and then we'll just. Move okay, on. okay. So meet here early at five, and that way you can get costumed up here, and then uh, get the roll the float over to the right. Covenant Church parking lot where you lead off, leave off from there. Also, if anyone, we're looking for a a, a star, a lighted star that uh, you know has plenty of light on it that we can sit on top of the. Uh, oh, I see someone waving back there, Mike. You got one. All right, uh, so if you guys could um, coordinate with Rick then, uh, they want to put this on top of the little stable that's on the float. Um, uh, he was just saying, we don't have a star, so 
Um, yeah, Rick, if you want to connect up with the Eggers, that would be great. What is that? Oh, it was Ken. Okay, it was Ken in the back. I saw a hand go up in the back there. So, Mike, if you got one, you can throw it in too. All right. <laughs> Also, uh, I know Tom Kloster, you were uh, getting people signed up to help out with the Gateway Gift uh, Christmas Wish. You, you have one more. So if one more person wants to talk to Tom after worship, um, and, and you'll, the Christmas Wish program is you purchase a gift for a Gateway client, and they tell you what, what their wish list is, so you get an idea of that. And then you, you wrap that gift, affix the name of the person very firmly so it doesn't fall off because otherwise they won't know who it goes to and then return those by December 10th which is a couple weeks from today so um, uh, if, uh, if, you, if you can help out Tom's got one more I think he had 25 originally so people have really stepped up and, and picked those up and, and uh, that's really great alright uh, we are ready then to begin our worship and if you'd please rise we're going to begin with a word of prayer Father in heaven, we look at the snowfall today and we, re, we are reminded of the passage in Isaiah that though our sins may be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. We thank you on this Christ the King Sunday that Jesus came to this earth to die on the cross for our sins. And we thank you that he will come again. He will come again uh, someday and declare himself king of all creation. And every knee will bow. And we give thanks for this in his name. Amen. We continue now with our confession and forgiveness. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways through the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn on this Christ the King Sunday is number 855, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
We continue on page 138 in the front part of the red hymnal, or you can follow on the screens before you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory, for Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, for God's love of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. O God of power and might, your Son shows us the way of service, and in him we inherit the riches of your grace. Give us the wisdom to know what is right and the strength to serve the world you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our choir anthem.
first lesson this morning is from Isaiah chapter 66. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite, in spirit and trembles at my word. He who slaughters an ox is like one who kills a man. He who sacrifices a lamb, like one who breaks a dog's neck. He who presents a grain offering, like one who offers pig's blood. He who makes a memorial offering of frankincense, like one who blesses an idol. These have chosen their own ways, and their soul delights in their abominations. I also will choose harsh treatment for them and bring their fears upon them, because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not listen, but they did what was evil in my eyes and chose that, that in which I did not delight. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hate you and cast you out for my name's sake have said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy but it is they who shall be put to shame. For behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger in fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment and by his sword with all flesh and those slain by the Lord shall be many. For I know their works and their thoughts and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and shall see my glory, and I will set a sign among them, and from them I will send survivors to the nations, to Tarshish, Pole, and Lud, who draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands far away that have not heard my nations. And they shall bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord, on horses and in chariots, and in litters, and on mules, and on dromedaries. To my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord, just as the Israelites bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord, and some of them also I will take for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me. For their worms shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. The word of the Lord. The responsive reading is Psalm 95, beginning with the first verse. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. The second lesson is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love and your love prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead 
and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel is heard according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. As you've noticed, the scripture readings have an end of the world focus to them. I'm going to be talking about that long passage from uh, in the first lesson from Isaiah 66, the final book of, or, or chapter of Isaiah, which he talks about the end times. And uh, this gospel reading, which I'll deal with in the children's time, is is uh, also a, one of the parables Jesus told about the final judgment. In Matthew 25, he writes, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit at his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Be Please be seated. We invite the children to come forward for our children's time. <clears throat> Come on down. We don't have many kids here today, do we? All right. <laughs> Might need a few more adults to help uh, <laughs> decorate the Christmas tree. Well, good to see you guys here today. Have got, uh, I wanted to ask you something. I'm going to get my bag over here. Um, the Bible says that, remember, Jesus was on earth before, many years ago. He came to this earth to die on the cross for our sins, didn't he? And then he rose again from the dead. He went back up to heaven. We call that the ascension. But before he left, he said, I am coming again. And when he comes again, that's going to be the end of this world. But that's nothing to be scared about because when this world comes to an end, we get to be in heaven, don't we? And so it's, it'll, be kind of a, it'll seem like a scary day, but it'll actually be kind of an exciting day. And the Bible says in, in our story for today, when Jesus comes again, he's going to look at his people who have believed in him and, he, and trusted in him, and he's going to say, I am so happy because of you. He's going to be so happy. He said, he's going to say this. He says, because when I was hungry, you gave me 
food, he said. And he said, when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I don't know if I, should I give you that? <laughs> and he says, when I was cold, you gave me something to keep me warm. Should we cover you up, Darcy? There you go. <laughs> and he says, when I was sick, you helped me out. So I've got some aspirin here, and I'll keep this. <laughs> and he says, thank you for doing all those wonderful things for me. And you know what God's people are going to say? They're going to say, Jesus, when did we ever see you hungry and give you food? Jesus, when did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you cold and gave you something to warm you up or, or sick and gave you something to help you? When did we do all these things for you? And you know what Jesus is going to say? He's going to say, whenever you did it to another person. See, Jesus loves all people, doesn't he? He says, when you did it to another person, it was like you did it to me. And he's going to say, thank you so much for that and welcome you into the, into the kingdom of heaven. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come into the joy of your master. And he's going to open his arms. Think about that. Someday when we go to heaven, when we leave this world, Jesus is going to be waiting for us with his arms wide open. Wouldn't it be great to get a hug from Jesus? Yeah, and that's going to happen. Every one of us will get that someday. Let's thank Jesus in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you very much for all that you have given us in this world, and we pray that you would help us to use our gifts to serve other people and help other people because we know when we help other people, we're really helping Jesus. And we look forward to that day when he says, welcome. And he opens his arms and hugs us and says, come into, come into the joy of heaven. I'm so glad you're here. We give thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And you can keep those if, if, uh, you're, if it's okay with your parents. <laughs> He's looking at the kids. If you can't drink it, you'll have to decide. <laughs> and you guys can come up here and have a treat. And, uh, and then we're going to sing our next song. Come on up, Darcy. As I handed Isaac that Mountain Dew, I realized I should have brought a bottle of water. Right? <laughs> the title of my sermon today is The King is Coming, and it is based on that passage from the very final words of the long book of Isaiah from chapter 66. Let me read one verse for you again, verse 18. Isaiah writes, And the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall all come, and they shall all see my glory. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, you know, several years ago, I guess it's been like 12 years ago now, our son Nathan moved uh, out to Los Angeles um, for work and to start working out there. And so uh, when he did that, it was in May of 2011, I decided to take a few days off and make the long cross-country drive with him in his car. And so, um, and then I, after he got settled in and helped him there, I would fly back to Chicago on my own. So we managed to load all the stuff, all of his possessions in the world, into that, that car 
on a Sunday afternoon, and we left just enough room for the two of us to squeeze in the driver and the passenger seats, and we had stuff coming over here in the middle, and uh, we left early on a Monday morning, and on that very first day, we drove all the way to my brother's house in Kearney, Nebraska, and we got up the next day, and we drove uh, through the Rocky Mountains. We had to stop the car a few times just to get out and enjoy the incredible scenery in the mountains there. On day three, we drove south uh, through Utah and decided to make a stop at Arches National Park. We spent a few hours there, and then we went on and, and stopped at the Four Corners Monument, where you can be in four states all at one time. Late in the afternoon, we uh, headed across northern Arizona, and wouldn't you know it, we got a flat tire in the middle of nowhere on the Navajo Reservation, and we had to unload all of the stuff that was in his trunk. Um, and set it in the ditch on the side of the road um, so that we could get the, the spare tire out of there. It was one of those mini spares. And, and so we got that, that uh, spare tire on there and the other one back into the trunk, and then we had to load all of that stuff back into the trunk, and we made it into Flagstaff on that mini spare and spent the night. In the morning, we got the tire fixed, um, and, and, of course, then we had to load, uh, you know, we had to unload everything into our hotel room in order to take the car over and get the tire fixed in the morning, then load everything back in after it was fixed. And then we drove on, we, went, we stopped at the Grand Canyon, spent a few hours there, and then it was on to LA. And we got to LA very late on Thursday evening, and with the help of his new roommates, uh, uh, six guys in a little three-bedroom apartment, uh, we unloaded the car. And then the next day I flew home. And it was a long and crazy and tiring four-day journey. But to tell you the truth, I was kind of sad to see it come to an end. And I, and I kind of get that feeling every November as we come to the end of a church year. You know, today is Christ the King Sunday, the final Sunday of this church year. Next week, as I mentioned, the ch new church year begins with that first Sunday in Advent. And as I look back at the year that has gone by, I give thanks to God for the wonderful times that we have had together as a church family. We celebrated some special holidays like Christmas and Easter and Pentecost and Reformation. And we had some weddings and baptisms. We confirmed some of our young people. We welcomed some new members. We also had awesome times of fellowship like the Old Wheels Car Show and the outdoor service and, and, uh, and picnic and our fall fellowship uh, that we just had a few weeks ago. But we also, of course, in this past year, had times of sorrow. We said goodbye to some wonderful people. And, of course, the one that comes to mind is, is Glenn Allen, who passed in September, because I always was looking right at Glenn during the worship service as he was uh, running the camera back there. So we come to the end of another church year, another journey around the sun, and it's always a little bittersweet. We're excited about the future, about what may lie ahead in the new year, but we are also a little sad because another year is drifting away in the rearview mirror. A few more of our church friends are gone home. But in the midst of conflicting emotions, we are lifted up, we are strengthened for the road ahead by our unshakable faith in the one who stands above all space and time. He is truly the king of the universe. And his name is Jesus Christ. If we did not have Jesus as our king, then every passing year would lead more and more into despair because every passing year would bring us closer to the end of our existence. But because Jesus is our king, we know that this world is not the end for us. We know that the vast majority of our lives is going to be lived on the other side of the grave. We know that our king has conquered death and we know that our king is coming again. And that's what Isaiah is telling us in this first lesson for today. Isaiah lived 700 years before Jesus was born, and yet he prophesied so accurately about the coming of the Messiah that it was just as if he had walked with Jesus for his entire life on this earth. Isaiah by far has more prophecies about Jesus than any other Old Testament prophet. In fact, there are so many prophecies about him in the book of Isaiah that he is sometimes referred to, it is sometimes referred to as the fifth gospel. In chapter 7, Isaiah prophesies about the birth of the Messiah to a virgin. 
In chapter 9, he says the Messiah will come from the line of David. He even calls him mighty God. In chapter 40, Isaiah prophesies about the ministry of John the Baptist, the voice of one crying in the wilderness who would prepare the way for the Messiah. In chapter 42 and again in chapter 61, Isaiah describes the ministry of the Messiah so well that Jesus uses those exact words when he announces the beginning of his own ministry. And of course, in chapter 53, Isaiah describes in vivid detail how the Messiah will suffer and die for the sins of his people. He says, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. <clears throat> and Isaiah goes on to say that after the Messiah is cut off from the land of the living and laid in his grave, then the Father will raise him up from the dead, and she shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. All of these prophecies, all of these visions, God has given to Isaiah. And then he takes Isaiah one step further. In the final chapter of the book, chapter 66, God gives Isaiah a vision of the end of the world. He allows Isaiah to see the second coming of the Messiah, the triumphant return of Jesus the Christ. And that's why the title of this sermon is The King is Coming. That's exactly what Isaiah sees. He sees the king coming down from heaven, lifting up his people, but bringing judgment on those who have rejected God and rebelled against him. And then he wraps it all up with an incredible vision of heaven itself. There are so many things that could be said about this final climactic vision of Isaiah, but I want to lift out three things this morning. The first thing is this. Isaiah says, the king will lift up those who are humble. Here's what he says in verses 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me that, that would be my place of rest? All these things my hand has made. And to all these things, all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. You know, I was in one of my former churches several years ago and I was working in my office one summer evening and I heard a noise out in the back parking lot and I went to check it out and I saw some kids skateboarding. And that in itself wasn't a big deal. Um, but they were also doing some tricks on the concrete pad that was just outside the back entrance. And so I opened the door and I said, hey guys, um, I don't mind if you skateboard back here, but please don't hop on this concrete pad. I said, if you look here, you can see that you're breaking off edges of the concrete. And I said it just like that. I said it very nicely. And one of the kids who was about 11 years old or so looked at me defiantly and said in his best snotty kid voice, he said, you can't tell us what to do. This is public property. Well, that got my back up a little bit. <laughs> a little pipsqueak, sassing back at me. <laughs> so I looked back at him, and with my best angry pastor voice, I said, this is not public property. This is church property. And I was going to let you skateboard back here, but now I would rather you leave. Well, that kid just stared back at me, and he wasn't going to move had this contemptuous look on his face. And meanwhile, his, his buddy was saying to him, let's just, let's just get out of here. <laughs> Come on, let's go. And that kid started to move slowly, but he kept his eye on me the whole way, staring me down. And he had this look that said, kind of like, if I could kill you, I would. <laughs> it was strange. Well, people, if I got angry because that 11-year-old was arrogant and defiant toward me, Imagine how God must feel when human beings whom he has lovingly created from the dust of the earth are arrogant and defiant toward him. Their creator, their, you know, who has given them life. Arrogance is the exact opposite of what Jesus will be looking for when he comes again. Jesus, who sits on his throne at the right hand of the Father, says, when I return to the earth in all of my glory, this is the one that I will look for. This is the one I will lift up. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. There are two things, notice he said there. The humble person has a contrite spirit, a spirit of true repentance. 
A humble person does not make excuses for his or her sin. A humble person truly confesses their sin and asks for God's forgiveness. And second, a humble person trembles at the word of God. In other words, we do not argue with the God, God's word in the Bible. A humble person does not think that he or she is smarter than God or more fair or more reasonable than God. The truly humble person seeks to understand the Bible to the best of their ability and then accepts that God's words are true and just and righteous. And when Jesus comes again, he will be looking for those people. He will lift up those who are humble. And then the second thing, lesson I want to pull out of this text, is that the king will bring judgment on those who are arrogant and rebellious. Who are the arrogant and rebellious? Well, Isaiah gives three examples. First of all, those who practice false piety. In other words, what Jesus would call a hypocrite. Here's how he describes it in verse 3. He is like one who slaughters an ox, and yet in his heart he's killing a man, is what he's saying. He sacrifices a life, but he breaks a dog's neck. A lamb, but he breaks a dog's neck. He presents a grain offering at the altar, but in God's eyes it's like one who offers pig's blood. He makes a memorial offering of frankincense, but in God's eyes it's like one who is blessing an idol. He's describing someone who does all the outwardly religious acts, but is rebellious against God in his or her heart. You know, a, a very extreme example of that would be, uh, if you remember several years ago, there was that BTK killer. He was a serial killer, and yet he was an active member of his Lutheran congregation down in, in uh, Wichita, Kansas. And uh, he was on the church board. He, had, he was, uh, um, had been an usher. He was very involved. So on the outward... He fooled everybody on the outside. He did all the pious things, and in his heart he had such evil. You know, in the parable of the wheat and the weeds, Jesus tells his disciples, we are not always going to be able to tell in this world who is righteous and who is the hypocrite. That's why we're not allowed to judge. But God can tell. And God will judge. The Bible says if a person has been doing all of the outward righteous acts, but has never truly repented in their hearts, has never truly given their heart to Jesus Christ and humbled themselves before for Jesus. That person's a hypocrite. But there's good news. The Bible says that a hypocrite can become a faithful believer at any time. All that person has to do is humble themselves before God and repent. And today is the day of repentance because Jesus the King is coming again. And then a second category of the arrogant and rebellious that Isaiah talks about is those who love their sin. He says, these have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations. <laughs> you know, we are all sinners, but the Bible teaches us that the proper response to our sin is to be ashamed of it and to confess it and to ask God to help us overcome it. God knows that we are weak. He knows that that, that we cannot overcome our sin by our own power. That's why Jesus had to go to the cross. And that is also why Jesus is always willing to forgive anyone who comes to him with a repentant heart. But if a person is defiantly sinning in some way, flaunting their rebellion and perversity, they should be worried. They should be very worried. Because Jesus the King is coming again. And then a third category of the arrogant and rebellious that Isaiah talks about here is those who persecute the righteous. Isaiah says this in verse 5, Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hate you and cast you out for my name's sake have said, Let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy, but it is they who shall be put to shame. I mean, God hates all sin. But he holds a special kind of anger, of wrath, for those who mock and persecute and torture and kill the followers of Jesus. You know, I, when I hear stories about Christians who have been abused or have been murdered around the world, it, it just, the anger rises in me. But it makes me just as angry to hear uh, arrogant people right here mock the faith of my brothers and sisters in Christ. When I hear those stories, 
I have to remind ourselves, Jesus tells us we are to love our enemies because by loving them, we, we, we may be able to win them over for Christ. But know this, those who attack Christians who mock their faith will one day have to deal with Jesus Christ at the final judgment when he comes in all of his glory. Isaiah says, For behold, the Lord will come in fire, his chariots like the whirlwind, to render his anger in fury and his rebuke with the flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment. So we know that when Jesus comes again, he is going to lift up the humble, those who are truly contrite in heart, who have an awe and respect for his word. And when he comes again, he will bring judgment on the arrogant and the rebellious, those who practice false piety, those who love their sin, those who persecute the righteous. And now Isaiah closes his book of prophecy with a pro powerful reminder that we must never grow complacent in our faith. We must always remember that this world and our lives in this world are only temporary. The third lesson of this final chapter of Isaiah is that there will indeed be a last day. Isaiah says three things about that last day. First, he says, there will be a gathering, a great gathering from all the nations. He writes in verses 18 to 20, then shall, they shall come and see my glory and I will set a sign among them and from them I will send survivors to the nations to Tarshish and Pul and Lud and draw, and who, who draw the bow to Tubal and Javan to the coastlands afar off that have not heard my fame or seen my glory. And they shall declare my glory among the nations. And they shall bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord. This is the theme that pops up throughout the book of Isaiah. Heaven is going to be a great gathering of believers from every race and every tongue and every nation. It is going to be a great tapestry of cultures and traditions all united in our common devotion to Jesus Christ. John Stott says, one of the disappointing things about the Christian church in this world is that we're so separated. We're separated by language, we're separated by culture, we're separated by race and ethnic traditions and biblical interpretations and doctrinal emphases and we can and should be making some moves in the direction of Christian unity right here on earth but Isaiah reminds us that the true unity the unity that we all long for is only going to be experienced in heaven and I want to be there and I want to see that with my own eyes but that's not all there's another dimension to the joy and unity of heaven that I long for and that Isaiah talks about he says, on that day, the believers will be welcomed into the joy of heaven. Isaiah says, for as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, so shall your offspring and your name remain. From new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. Heaven's going to be the place that John describes in Revelation 21. Where, there is, where death shall be no more, and neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Heaven is the place Jesus is preparing for those who love him, for those who believe in him as their Lord and Savior and receive him into their hearts. But then Isaiah does talk about the rebellious and what will happen to them on that day. He says, for those who reject Christ, for those who rebel against him, who want nothing to do with his love and grace and mercy. There is an ominous warning. Now, I don't know at the end of the world, it may be that when Jesus comes again, that will be another opportunity for people to see him in his glory and come to believe in him. And, and God may give everyone that opportunity at that moment. But we know from the scriptures that some, even if they have that opportunity, will reject it. And so the Lord says in Isaiah 66, 24, and they shall go out and look on the dead bodies who have rebelled against me. For their worms shall die, and their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. And Jesus quotes this very verse in, in Mark chapter 9. He draws a stark contrast between the joy of heaven, which he offers to all who humble themselves before Christ, and the suffering of hell, 
which is the final home of those who hate him and reject him and rebel against him. And the choice that Isaiah offered, the choice Jesus offered, is the same one he offers everyone today. Give your heart to Jesus Christ and know the joy of heaven. Reject Jesus and know the suffering of life apart from God in hell. Because the king is coming. He's coming someday in the future to bring the world to an end, but he's also coming right now to each and every one of us, speaking to our hearts, inviting us to have that relationship with him right now. And I know that most of you here have already accepted Jesus into your hearts. If, if there are any here who have not, I hope you will accept him today, because today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that the king wants to come to you. Today is the day he wants to live in your heart. It is the day he wants to be your Lord. And he wants this so that one day when your life in this world is over, you can come and live with him in heaven from new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath for all eternity. And that's what Jesus offers us today. You know, I talked about uh, leaving this world and going to heaven one day and talked about uh, how... how um, in one of my previous churches, how Jesus will welcome us with open arms. And shortly after that, uh, uh, someone came to me with a drawing that he had made of Jesus holding his open arms uh, as, as a person enters into heaven. And I, I, that's a day I look for. That's a day I long for. And I hope you long for it as well. Because the King is coming again. Amen and amen. Please rise. And we are going to confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was cruised, I died and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to sing our next hymn, O Worship the King. <laughs>
Please be seated for the prayers of the church. so much for this day when we celebrate the kinghood of our dear Jesus Christ. We crown him, we praise him, and we thank you for him. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done for us, for coming and saving us from our sins. And we ask you to help us to recognize our sin, to repent, and humble ourselves before you so that when your final judgment comes, you will indeed say, come with me, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Dear Father, we thank you so much for this season of Thanksgiving. We thank you for the wonderful harvest that we have been able to bring in to the storage places, and we thank you for the way you have met our needs. And we ask that you give us the generosity to meet the needs of those not so fortunate as us. And may all of us truly show Jesus to those around us. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We ask you to be with those um, persecuted Christians around the world who in this season are having a problem just worshiping together. Um, some are losing their lives because they declare their faith. Some are losing their churches because they are being burned down. Some are losing their families because their family is rejecting them. Please fill their hearts with your Holy Spirit and bring them a peace that passes all understanding. And please help to bring to an end this persecution and may their faithfulness show to those who are persecuting them that they are on the wrong side and may their hearts be softened. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And now we ask your presence with those in our midst who are suffering from all kinds of things. We pray for Jeff Jaquis, Linda Clock, Karen May, Lauren Cook, Sean Lewis, Nancy O'Connor, Trudy Kryling, Eric Davis, Gary Shale, Nick Sandy and Melissa Smith, Martis Vernon, and any others that we name in our hearts. We ask you to fill them with your healing, with your love, and with your presence. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Thank you for this coming season of Advent. And please give lots of joy to those decorating today. And may we all enjoy this coming season of Advent and Christmas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please rise. And let us pray together with the words our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 805, Lead On, O King Eternal.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.